If you're looking to elevate your programming skills, to learn how to write better code or more maintainable code, and learn how to think about programming at a higher level, this video series is for you. This video is the introduction to my new series called Write Better Code. In this series, I will explore the fundamental concepts of software design. Having a good design means that your code is easier to read and easier to change, which is our entire job. So it basically makes our jobs easier. Let's talk about knowledge and responsibilities. Let's say that, for example, we are writing some code to calculate income tax. Now, when you do that, you are embedding the knowledge of how to calculate income tax in your code here. Another way to look at it is that this piece of code now has the responsibility to calculate income tax for you whenever you need it. Let's look at another example. This function here does a binary search uh, operation on an array of numbers, and it can look for a target number in that array. Once again, the knowledge of how to perform a search or specifically a binary search in an array of numbers is embedded in this code here. This code now has the responsibility to do that search whenever you need it. It's kind of like hiring someone to do a job for you, except that you have to tell them exactly how to do everything about that job. But once you do, you don't have to think about it ever again. Whenever you need that job done, you just use that piece of code. What this allows you to do is to think about your code in terms of the high level responsibilities or the knowledge that it represents. It allows you to escape the syntax, the variable, the assignments, the loops, the if statements, the math, whatever. It allows you to escape all of that and think of the high level responsibility that this piece of code has. What it also allows you to do is to think about only the piece of responsibility that the code represents when you're working on it. For example, if I'm working on this piece of code, I only need to think about how income tax is calculated and nothing else. If I'm working on any other piece of code, I don't have to think about how income tax is calculated because I know that the, that responsibility is part of this function here and it doesn't need to be part of any other piece of code. Let's take a look at another example. This function here called isAvailable takes two dates and the list of bookings and it tells us if the thing that we're trying to book is available between those two dates or not by looking for conflicts with existing bookings. Then this other function called book vehicle does the actual job of booking something, in this case, a vehicle for a given start and end date. Now this function here doesn't care about how we check for conflicts or what that responsibility or what that piece of knowledge looks like. The only piece of knowledge here is how to create a vehicle booking in our system. And here in this function, the only piece of knowledge or the only piece of responsibility is how to check for conflicts for a new booking and a list of existing booking. That's it. This function here doesn't care at all about how exactly we check for conflicts because that's not its responsibility. That's the responsibility of the other function. So it will just delegate it when it's needed. You can probably start to see some benefits here. This one function is not polluted with too many responsibilities. It's easy to read. You can see that it's getting a list of existing bookings. It's checking for availability. If it's not available, it throws an error and then it creates a new booking. That's it. It's just one responsibility of how to create a new booking. And here, the only responsibility is how to check for conflicts. And the second part, this is also easy to change because the responsibilities are clearly defined. For example, if tomorrow the business or the client, they come to me and say that, okay, we need a minimum 24 hour gap between bookings. That's pretty easy for us because the only place where the knowledge of how to check for conflicts is defined is in this function. So all we have to do is add a little bit of code that adds 24 hours to the end date and subtracts 24 hours from the start date and then use those two dates instead to check for conflicts instead of the original start and end date. That's it. Nothing else in our application had to change because the only piece of code that had the responsibility of checking for conflicts is right here, nothing else. This function that creates a new booking didn't have to change at all because it's not responsible for checking for conflicts. This is the power that we get. If we can precisely define the pieces of responsibility 
that our code has or every piece of our code has. If you have not done this before, it'll take a little bit of practice and getting used to, to be able to look at code and not see the assignments and the variables and the programming things that we're used to, and instead see the high level responsibilities that that code represents. Let's try to find some patterns or different types of knowledge that we can put in code. Going back to our income tax example, if you look at this hard enough, you might recognize that this function actually has two responsibilities. The first one obviously is to calculate income tax, but it also has the responsibility of knowing what the tax brackets are. These are two very related but different and separate pieces of responsibilities. Of course, you can move this out of here. You can move the bracket definition somewhere else and pass that in as a parameter so that this function no longer has the responsibility of knowing what the brackets are. It only has the responsibility of calculating income tax. That's it. For now, this function has both those responsibilities. You can have the responsibility of knowing something or the responsibility of doing something. In this case, knowing what the brackets are and knowing how to calculate income tax based on the brackets. Going to our second example, this is pretty straightforward. All this function knows is how to search for a number within an array of numbers using the binary search. It doesn't have a lot of data in it or really anything, but it knows how to execute binary search on an array. This is where things get more interesting. Now we saw earlier that this function here knows how to look for conflicts with a new booking and with existing bookings. And this function here knows how to create a new booking. There's a little more going on if you look at it hard enough. For example, this function here not only knows how to look for conflicts, but it also knows something very subtle, which is the structure of the booking object. Now, the definition here is in line for simplicity, but in a more realistic situation like this, the definition is not in line here anymore, but this function still is expecting an end property, which is going to be a date, and a start property, which is also going to be a date. So this function also has the knowledge of what the booking object looks like, and it relies on that knowledge to be accurate. This is important because this makes it really hard to change the structure of the booking object. Usually what happens is that the knowledge of object structures or data structures is spread across the application and a lot of different parts of your application know about the structure of some data structure, especially if it's an important business or domain object. That makes it hard to change because you might change it in one place and forget about changing it in other places. Static analysis tools like TypeScript help with this but they only help with it in the same program. If you're talking to another piece of software over the network, you don't even have the luxury of static analysis most of the time. So we identified another type of knowledge, which is the structure of an object or some data type, which means this function here now has two responsibilities. One is knowing what the structure of the booking object looks like. And the other obviously is to calculate conflicts or calculate availability. Now, if we come down to this function, once again, we'll see db.bookings.find, which means there is a database object somewhere. And this function has the knowledge that the object will have a bookings property and that the bookings object will have a find and an insert method. Another really subtle piece of knowledge that's hidden here is simply the existence of the db object and also the is available function. This function here assumes or knows that there is a DB object somewhere in the same piece of code and obviously what its structure is going to look like. We can also say that this function is dependent on the database object. Also the is available function. So not only knows what the structure of the DB object looks like, it also knows that it's going to exist. The other function doesn't know that. It's not the same as in the other function because we were passing it in. We are not just using it from somewhere else, but here we're not passing in the database object. So this function here depends and relies on this database object. Finally, there is one more subtle piece of knowledge or piece of responsibility that's embedded in this function. Can you find it? Okay, I'll just tell you what it is. This function makes 
a decision right here. It makes a decision of whether to allow or reject a new booking. Once again, it's very subtle, but it's very important to note because this is a piece of responsibility that can change. Right now, this function will reject a new booking if it's not available, which sounds straightforward. But once again, the business might come to me tomorrow and say that, hey, let's not reject new bookings if it's not available. Let's, let's say, put them on some sort of a wait list. And if another existing booking happens to cancel that clashes with this one, we'll finalize this booking. Well, if that happens to me, I know what I need to do because there's only one place in my whole code where the responsibility of making that decision is embedded and it's right here. So all I need to do is to get rid of this and instead mark the booking as waitlisted so that later we can do whatever operation with it that we need to. But all we had to do was to change the decision from simply rejecting it to adding a flag. And we were able to do that because we knew exactly where the responsibility of making that decision was. So I hope that was useful for you because if it was, I got some good news. Learning to think about your code in terms of its high level responsibilities is just the beginning. Everything that you can find out there about software design and architecture, any kinds of best practices or patterns or paradigms, they all rely on this one fundamental concept of thinking about your code on a higher level. Object-oriented programming is different from functional programming, basically in just how they recommend you to assign responsibilities to your code. That's it. Domain-driven design is a huge concept in software development, and it's really all about making sure that the knowledge in your application or in your code aligns with the knowledge that your users have or your business experts have. I can talk about this for hours. And that's exactly why this is a video series. So once again, if you found this helpful, like the video and please go ahead and subscribe to the channel because this entire video series is going to be a lot more useful and a lot more fun.